Okay, the recording has started. Take it away, Bernard. Welcome, everyone, to the June virtual interim of the Weber to See Working Group. Just a reminder of the IPR policy. We abide by the W3C patent policy, and only the people and companies listed on the are allowed to make substantive contributions to the Weber to See specs. So today we're going to talk about some new work and then go over the usual uh, number of privacy security issues and hopefully make progress on some of those. So a little bit about the meeting. We have links here to the various drafts of things. Um, we have a link to the guys are on the work, working group wiki. Uh, we do need a scribe. Do we have a volunteer for that? Uh, Henrik, are you uh, sure. scribe? I can scribe. Okay. Okay. Um, and this meeting is being recorded. We've turned recording on, and of course, we'll upload that along uh, with the minutes uh, afterwards. Okay, so here's what's on the agenda. Um, I'll talk about the state of simulcast testing. Uh, Harold will then present insertable streams. We have a Weber to see PC security issue on port scanning, which Harold will talk about. Um, and then um, some privacy and security issues relating to media capture and streams, media capture output. And then uh, UN will a little bit about automation of media capture. So it's agenda. Okay, simul testing. Just want to give everyone an update on what's going on. So at various points, we've talked about how to test simulcast in WPT. Uh, it's tricky, of course, because WPT is only running on a single browser, but um, on some work that FIPO and Florent did, we do have simulcast loopback tests now in WPT. So uh, there were, it started off with two tests. One was a basic loopback test, which sent simulcast and then through some SDP munging received it on the browser. Uh, and that demonstrated the ability to send simulcast and also to receive and render each encoding. Um, and so in the test, uh, we tested VP8 and H264. And then basically the coverage here was we tested air transceiver to create the multiple encodings. And then we were essentially testing the ability to render RID a uh, read header extension and then receive it as a mid header extension. Kind of tested those code paths. Um, and then we had a, a get stats version of the test, which basically then retrieved the stats and demonstrated that the that's corresponding to the RIDs were retrievable. That test does not demonstrate that the stats are actually just that they can be retrieved. Um, so that's how we started off. And we uh, updated section 541 of the spec to try to uh, account for what portions of, the, of that simulcast section were actually covered. So that's how we started out. And then the next question uh, that Dom asked in particular was, can, how far can we end this WPT test coverage um, to test the test uh, functionality? So we've had some, a couple of ideas on how we might do that. One is just to have codec specific to make sure that Simulcast works for each of the video codecs. And so we have a CL that's landed H.264 and VP8. Uh, of course, we can probably extend this to test VP9, AV1, whatever, whatever comes in. It's a fairly simple change uh, to do that. So, so that's one avenue in the coverage is to test each codec. Um, another aspect is whether the RTC, RTP encoding parameters actually what we think they ought to do. Um, and so one of them was to, one idea was to set uh, given simulcast streams to active, or active true or active false, and see if that does what it's supposed to do. So we have a CL that landed to do that. Um, if it's false, we shouldn't be sending anything. Um, so we, we are testing that now. FIPO has worked on a test for max frame rate, 
And that test is to basically test that setting a value results in a it's actually less than the one we requested. Um, the test that was submitted had an issue, I think, that Harold found where it was looking at the aggregate. It wasn't exactly uh, clear in all circumstances that it would work, but we're uh, looking at uh, updating it to address that. So I think we're on our way to getting a max frame rate test in. Um, and I guess using something pretty similar, we could test max bit rate to see that it set a value. You actually got a bit rate less than what you asked for. Um, and the remaining one that we thought in this category was scale resolution down by, which would basically try to see that we got a resolution that was approximating the one we asked for. Um, I think uh, Yanni Barr raised some issues about the defaults in scale resolution down by, uh, but I think we could, uh, we, could, we could try this one as well. So that's kind of the avenues we're exploring now to get better coverage. Um, there are some things we just can't test in WPT. Uh, in loopback, you don't have any loss, so you can't test any robustness stuff. Um, and so no RTX or RED or FAT or RREDs. Um, of course, you can't test interop because there's only a, one browser. You need kite for that. Um, do we have any comments or suggestions from the group of other things that we might think about uh, to get better simultaneous test coverage? Anything else anybody's encountered out there that we might want to make sure works? Um, OK, uh, Bernard, yeah. Bernard, yeah. Bernard, yes. just, go ahead. I think when we had that discussion in, in Lyon, you mentioned most of the time the simulcast problem, you're getting the, the ticket practically are, are related to the media server as well, right? Um, Sometimes you said, sometimes I got ticket against Janice, sometimes I get ticket against Jitsi, sometimes I get ticket about this, 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 and that. Um, is it something we still want to put on the table and, and have, uh, at least for the open source one, have a test for or not? Because we it was mentioned in, in, in Lyon, so I think we should either close that and remove it or, or keep it alive, but make a decision there. Well, I think... Um... This isn't a substitute for kite tests. It's just that, um, and, and if there are, uh, were, are, so I'm not saying we shouldn't do those, still do those kite tests. I think they should be done. Um, but what we were finding is if you look through the bugs, there were very basic things that were being caught and were actually ending up in uh, sometimes uh, in dev, dev Final releases, um, like not not test spec, uh, a, a very basic thing. So, um, and we did find through these simulcast tests, we did find some uh, pretty horrendous protocol problems, like not being able to deal with a mid header extension. Um, so, I mean, the the major question. Uh, it, so, this is pretending to c cover everything, but. We just wanted to get some basics in there so that uh, we wouldn't go shipping browsers that didn't, you know, support a think of encodec and simulcast or something like that. Um, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. So I think I think the kite tests are still needed for a system. I mean, like for example, if anybody's actually building an application, they'd be kind of insane to not do an end-to-end -end kind of a test um, to make sure the whole system was working. Um, does that make sense, so, Alex? Bit, yeah, and, and another question, if I may, but this one might be maybe for Henrik. Um, in the latest uh, Chrome, um, there is actually stats for simulcast that yes. make, makes a difference based on SSRC. Uh, yes. mm -hmm. and, and I think here we speak about making a difference based on our ID. So I don't know which way we want to do or if it's actually very, very clear in the spec uh, that I'm, I'm worrying about the AV1 implementation, for example, also. Mm. So do we attach the stat, to, or do we segregate the different layer stats? The different layers uh, can be, there's the SSRC and the RID, I believe. Yes. And 
there's supposed to be a sender stats object that ties them together, but it it doesn't provide any new information. So you can tell the the SSIC, the RID, and the track identifier. I think that's good enough to know which layer you're talking about. Yeah, currently the tests we have only test the RID one because you know we had a version of Playground that dealt with the SSRCs, but it could only run on Firefox. Um, so uh, we that was that was the thing required to kind of pull together the stats on the SSRC with the actual. Uh, right, I'm just uh, I'm know, trying to clarify parameters. where where if the spec is going in one direction and not the other because I know different browser implement different flavor and different SFU implement different flavor, but not not all of them implement both SSRC and, and RID and MID, right? So what, what is right. the spec saying? Is the spec saying we need to support all the cases or is the spec saying we should do one way and not the other? That's just a clarification question. Well, it's really an ITF issue, not a uh, API issue. Well, in this, if get stat if get stat is doing it based on SSRC, it kind of percolates. Well, stats that, doing that stats is doing both. It's so that's doing required. Both. The SSRC yeah. is uh, I view that as debugging information. The thing you use in the yeah. API and the thing you use to identify things in stats is the RID. Uh, yeah. So that discussion has not changed. But yeah, the SSRC is exposed, and in terms of implementation. Well, any RTP stream has an SSRC, so that's just yeah. It was always on the wire, but uh, get stats is the only way uh, that a spec compliant browser uh, where you would be able to tell the SSRC from the application layer. And right. With that. Okay, spec, understood. That that clarified. Yeah, as a as a practical that's, matter, that's exactly Al, I mean, we have an open issue which we're going to talk about at some point about how to. The problem is what we're. In our current tests, we're testing that we can retrieve the stats, right? We're not testing that the stats actually make any sense. <laughs> um, that's and right. that's, a, that's a kind of a bigger question. I think we, we're, at least on the RID basis, I think we could test that the, the stats make sense by linking them to the encoding parameters, at least to that extent. For SSRCs, I don't think we can write a test like that run in all browsers. So we're kind of stuck. And in general, we have that kind of open issue on the stats is not just to test whether you can retrieve them, but actually whether they actually work. Um, and that's a much harder problem in general. Um, <coughs> since but I doing, think, uh, yeah. Since you're doing, you're doing the, the, the one browser tests, the, you at least can check that the SSRC on one end is the same as the SSRC on the other end. And bytes sent is at least, at least bigger than bytes received, and so on. There's a lot mm -hmm. you can test. Okay. For some ver version of sanity. Okay, so maybe we can have in the notes to the meeting. We want to explore uh, maybe how to test the sanity of stats. Maybe extending some of these ideas um, to do that for the SSRC as well as for the RID. How about that? as a resolution uh, uh, for going forward. Um, uh, yes. I think that might be, Henrik, do you agree that might be the, I, I mean, I have this, we have this open issue of how to test whether the stats actually work. I think this might be a way to do it because you're actually bringing up a, a real simulcast and trying to, you, you know that you have some idea of what ought to come out of the stats. Um, I mean, it's by no means extensive coverage, but at least it would do something. Yeah, you could uh, you could test that what the sender side claims is roughly the same as what the receiver side claims. Right. You couldn't, you couldn't uh, test on the level where like I send one packet, therefore a packet by uh, goes up by one. That does not work in web platform test. Right. Okay. Um. Bernard, just to be clear, um, so we, we want to show W3C that we have interrupts. So my guess is that w, WPT is good for um, browser unit testing, but we mm -hmm. might still need to uh, provide W3C like uh, a kite report so that we see that simulcast from uh, Firefox to Chrome 
going through uh, whatever SFU is actually somehow working. Yeah, that is, is that the plan. plan. We still need the kite test to demonstrate that. Um, okay, cool. But what we found in these WPT tests is <laughs> there was a lot of very, very basic stuff that wasn't working. <laughs> that broken. So um, at that kind of foundation of uh, and, and stuff, because if you don't even cast yeah. yourself, <laughs> it's stuff sending it to someone else. Um, but sure. yes, we do absolutely. Okay. Dr. Alex, Dr. Alex Ford is going to be an important part of our uh, uh, going to uh, PR. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm planning to to provide the data when it, whenever needed. Uh, I usually make them before the the meetings. Um, I understand mm -hmm. that uh, there will not be a face-to-face -face meeting in Vancouver, correct? It's going to be uh, virtual this year? Yeah, W3C has gone virtual, and of course, I'd be meeting in Madrid. Uh, right. They haven't um, canceled Thailand yet, but I, they might, yeah. Yeah, I hope they won't, but uh, anyway, that's a different question. If the editors or DOM uh, require me to rerun the test before the end of the year to, to have some data specifically on Simulcast, um, we are available, of course. Do not hesitate. But we're not we're not running them on a weekly basis for the time being. So I guess that's another follow up, uh, Henrik. For uh, I guess to work with Dom to figure out we should run the, run the kite again. Probably we would need we, uh, once we get these basic simulcasting, uh, we can evaluate the pass rates. Um, and once, once we, I think we're close to passing on all on a bunch of browsers. Once we get those, we can start. Right. Um, probably not good to wait till the last minute because we might find stuff that needs, needs a while to be fixed. Uh, probably, I suspect we would we would start talking about this around T pack in the fall. That makes sense. Um, we wouldn't be finished. It might be a good time to go over the, the test status. Okay. So that's that's it for simulcast testing. I'm going to turn it over to Harold for insertable streams. Yeah. So <clears throat> status uh, insertable streams. I won't bore you with uh, re repeating the the design and the details uh, we've covered that in previous meetings. So just uh, rehash. This is uh, inserting JavaScript, letting the web application insert itself between the uh, encoding step and an outgoing transport, and between the incoming transport and the decode step. Next slide. So Chrome has implemented it. Available if you turn on exper Enable Experimental Web Platform Features and available as an origin trial for anyone or any website that wants to register to use it on all Chrome 83 users. Duo uses it and Jitsi. Those are using it for end-to-end -end additional frame encryption. And a number of people are doing a number of experiments for other things you can do when you have access to this particular point in the chain. For instance, uh, adding tag-along data for, for AR uh, systems. Uh, I now have a an explainer and a spec document that conform roughly to what's in Chrome 84, which is slightly changed from 83. We still need more brain work to be done on what metadata you need in, a, in addition to, uh, to having the bytes of the frame. That's metadata that you need on out outgoing to do the right, the right things because not everything is obvious from the frame. And metadata you need on the incoming side because Again, not everything is obvious from the from the bytes in the pay in, in the frame. So the two questions that are the, the big question in front of the group today are is can we adopt this as a working group deliverable document 
as a starting point for uh, creating an API we all can agree on, agree on and implement for this purpose. So Bernard put out the call for consensus and uh, I would say the feedback on the list has been positive. So that's the status. If you want to look at the next slide again. Do you want to talk about this part first or do you want to talk about the next slides first? I'd like to oh, why don't over the, yeah, I got this slide and one more and then we, okay. can, we can open up for discussion. So limitations of this particular API, we can't create frames from JavaScript, which implies that uh, you can't synthesize the stream from uh, something other than the receivers or the senders. You can't change the metadata. You get instructions that this is a size, this is a keyframe, this is a number of other things. And that's information that yeah, to JavaScript, it's not something you can change. And there's no interaction with the feedback signals. That is, when transport tells you, hey, you're sending, sending too much data, that goes back to the codec. The encoder say, please turn down. And JavaScript doesn't see that signal and can't modify that signal, which means that it might be completely wrong for some applications of this API. So this API is like the beginning of a journey. That's not the end point. If you take a quick look at the next slide, some of the boxes people have been wanting to get at are outlined in red on this one. I mean, people want to have access to raw data, and some of the people who want raw data want to have access to that data without having to bother with a peer connection to get at it. But they still want to have it in a powerful API connection for some applications. There are some people who want to replace the whole transport and think that this kind of API allows them to do so with uh, minimal disruption to the rest of the ecosystem. And there are people who want to bring your own encoder or decoder so that they can do things outside of the envelope of what, what the browser can deliver in a reasonable time with reasonable standards. So, but again, back to, uh, back to slide nine. The, this is not the question for the group. The, the question is, should we adopt this and say that this is a, this is a work item of the World Web, Web Consortium that we're going to uh, work on with the aim of making it a standard. Okay, now we can open up for discussion. Hi, yeah, Eric Rascola. Um, I can certainly send this to the list, but I figured I might as well say it in person too. Um, I mean, so as a mechanism for doing manipulation of some of the things you suggest, um, you know, uh, rate adaptation or you know, adding metadata, this seems like totally reasonable. Um, but um, the extent to which this is intended for end-to-end -end encryption, this seems like less reasonable. Um, so. Um, I mean, I have, I have a number of, of concerns here, um, um, some of which I think but just, everyone raised. Eric, just, just one point. Uh, I'd like to point out that the end-to-end -end encryption use case has been removed for, from WebRTC NB use cases. So actually, we can't justify this API for use in end-to-end -end encryption solely, because that is no longer a use case. Sure. Well, uh, but, but perhaps so, but this document refers to end-to-end -end encryption as a use case. Um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, th though my impression of what was removed is actually the it was actually saying slightly different. We could talk about that um, separately. Um, yeah. Um, so um, I mean, I think I think I should be clear. Like I'm 100% in favor of end-to-end -end encryption. I think that's 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 pretty obvious. Um, um, but um, you know, uh, the this particular uh, variant of it, I think, has like a number of like um, you know. Um, 
like not amazing properties. Um, uh, first of, uh, you know, first of all, like the key management, um, like you actually have to solve the key management problem if you actually want to make a stab at end encryption and having the keys in JavaScript is like pretty, like not amazing. Um, um, <laughs> so, I mean, if the working group wants to work on like end encryption, I think that'd be great. But like having sort of like this as a partial put in end encryption without like a commitment to work on the end of it, rest of it seems like actually has a pretty high risk of getting scrapped in a worse equilibrium than the one we are now. Um, you know, um, you know, even within the assumption set that you're doing the the the, the, the um the, the crypto, uh, sorry, the, the key management in JavaScript, um, you know, this particular design is not amazing. Um, so first, because it breaks isolated streams, um, any kind of a, in fact, breaks any kind of story you could make about information flow tracking about the data goes because the data has to get re exfilled out into the into, into these um in, into these objects. Um, um, so I think, you know, um, and second, because it frankly encourages roll your own crypto and like, you know, we keep being reminded about how, how a bad idea is let people roll their own crypto, um, you know, most recently with Zoom um, and ECB. Um, so, um, you know, uh, and, and of course, crypto and crypto and WASM is itself not a great idea because WASM isn't really built for doing, you know, um, you know, constant time cryptography. So, I mean, I think if you want it, if, if, if a purpose of, you know, having um, this be support and then crypto, um, or so, is what you're looking for. What you want is to be able to have, and I think you on had this in uh, issue maybe 17. Um, you know, you want to have an extra, a, a, a canned like pod that takes in a key and guarantees that it does cryptographic processing to a specific protocol, um, uh, not like a general like here here's, has like an escape hatch to JavaScript and WASM. Um, um, so um, because that that guarantees the right confinement, it guarantees the protocol is correct. Um, so um, you know. I, I can see a bunch of resolutions here, but I think the resolution where this is adopted and has this use case has a listed use case end to end is not a great one. Yeah, the problem with deploying end to end in a different manner is that, uh, frankly, we're not getting it deployed. So it's uh, like. The, the, the thing that forced my hand in many ways on, on, on uh, using this kind of style for end-to-end -end encryption on, I mean, ad not admitting it will be silly. Uh, we needed to do end-to-end -end encryption and we needed to do, do it with a signaling protocol that wasn't standard, wouldn't become a standard, wasn't embedded in browser, would never be embedded in browser. But we had to interoperate with it. So yeah, I don't think that's either think that's uh, no end-to-end -end encryption or end-to-end -end encryption that used used key management that was not embedded in the browser. Right. I don't think that's inconsistent with that 47% of what I just said. Um which is that which is about having this being done in JavaScript rather than being done um with with wire encoding protocols that are in the browser, even if key management is externalized to JavaScript. There's no particular need for innovation on that front. Eric, you mean that the encryption bits, you, know, you, you could have a module provided by the browser that does the encryption bits. Yeah, the GS frame, for instance, right? And from, right. Yeah, um, I, I like this approach. I, I, I think I, I'm a proponent. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm a proponent of yeah. Um, I I see the insertable stream um, proposal and the JavaScript solution as something like uh, a short, a very short term solution, and we should definitely uh, be sure that we have uh, a long term roadmap that we can build upon and, for instance, have um, the, the crypto built in uh, in the in the browser, and that that it would be so easy to use but everybody will switch to that. Um, or at least all the good people will switch to that. Um, we, we, we cannot just stop at the first step, which is to let people implement end-to-end -end encryption just in pure JavaScript. We, we need to provide uh, a full solution, but I think that shipping progressively is, is probably okay. We sure, I guess, my, anyway. I guess my put would be like, that my proposal would be to Adopt this document, but remove the end encryption piece, which has no actual semantic impact, but stops encouraging people to do something which you think is not good practice going forward. And um, 
I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm saying it stops, stops encouraging it and thus avoids the situation that we, that suggests that we are endorsing that as the, as the final solution, as, as the appropriate end solution. But we should work on that. So I agree. I 100% agree. I'd like to work on that. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a that's a yeah. way forward that they could do. What I what makes me uncomfortable with it is that it's effectively trying to. It's how to say it. It's not. We're, we're telling a story that is different from what's actually happening, in order to make it more probable probable that we that want what we want want to have happen will happen isn't that the point of what standards is in general <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and in general right we do tie the proved use cases and intent isn't one of those uh, yeah um, i, mean, I, I wonder if there's the, does mention end -to -end encryption as a use case a relevant yeah, question if we drop the end-to-end -end encryption as a uh, an endorsed goal of this. What are the use cases that we want to address? Well, the that we mentioned were the uh, we have a use case for the AR stuff, and all the, uh, we have the uh, funds and learning more to the raw data. But, so those but, are but which. But we should be clear that most people are excited about insertable screen just because of end to end encryption. So. So one Some thing I point are. out, right? One thing, one thing I point out is the natural extensions. I understand it to this API, which is that the way I mean, that, that what what you would expect to do, um, if I understand if I understand this API correctly, is um, that we could simply invent a kind of doodad. I'm not sure what to call it. Pod. <laughs> uh, what, what do you call it in suitable streams? You call them? Oh, I don't even know what you call them. The transformer. Remember. Is a it? transformer, like built-in transformer. Uh, you know, crypto tr S frame transformer, and that would fit na very naturally into this framework. Um, and in fact, you could polyfill that, right? Um, um, so, right. Um, so I think I think that, I mean there's a fairly natural bridge to that. Um, uh, and as you know, there's been some look work work at um, start, starting to be some look at ITF in terms of doing um, S frames um, as some sort of specification. Um, so um, I mean, I'm no I, I haven't like thought about S frame enough to really know if it's exactly the right thing. Um, but um, uh, but I think like I guess I guess what I'm what I'm sad about as I say is is the implication that like the like you know I mean, uh, this is a, this is like the the term we use here is recommendation and the idea that we're going to recommend this as a practice seems like extremely like unsound. So I, I like this idea that we're relying on a, a prepackaged things because the kind of um, aligns I forget what the phrase originates for um, paving the cow paths right like if people are, are creating cow paths uh, by experimenting with just JavaScript thing then these pre-baked pods could be like pavers we lay down that are the nice way and you can step off the pavers and do your new thing um, but you're you're uh, on your own then um, I, I think the in addition to the end-to-end -end concerns here like uh, it seems like that could help address some of these concerns about um, uh, feedback and, and statistics and congestion control and things like that, right? Like for specific use cases where there's a likely impact on something like congestion control, we could actually do a design process around a module that could that interacts properly um, and do that right and give people a, a safe path to do that on. And you know, people can continue, continue to experiment and try new things um, using a general API, but have the safe thing to do that. Um, so I think there's a couple of um, motivations pointing toward this, this like, this dual approach of having a, a general API that can be used for experimentation and you know use at your own risk, but also um, pre-baked things that make things a bit safer. So uh, it, it would actually make sense to me if we expressed the the end-to-end -end, uh, encryption uh, non-use case as uh, this uh, this API allows you to experiment with. Uh, approaches for end-to-end -end encryption in advance of standardization uh, uh, and caveat these, these concerns uh, uh, because, because these concerns can't be solved uh, in, in this way, but it allows you experimentation. That's a, that's a nice, nice statement of what, the, what we could use this as a use case. I think I'd be comfortable with that. Hmm. 
What are you? Can we uh, can we get that use case written down somehow? Because it's not the use cases. I, I've been removed, removed, removed it. I've been one. Um, why? I, so, so I guess I'm going to defer to to the chairs and Dom on the process point. Um, because I've not it's now not quite clear to me. It's not now not quite clear to me what the uh, um what the state of the, of the use case is. <laughs> well, the, the state the only one we have, Eric, because we removed the uh, the trusted JavaScript one, is where JavaScript is not trusted. And that's the yeah. only use, and that's the only one we have in the document. And my question here is: we're, I think we're talking a hybrid where JavaScript has to be trusted to provide the frame, but I guess we're we're be talking potentially about built-in module that would actually do the crypto. So you well, yeah, I mean, I mean, so, I, mean so it's, I mean, I think it's clear. That, like the the design where you polyfill in JavaScript, like is trusted JavaScript, right? I mean, like it just is. Um, the um, the design where you you know the design where you uh, uh, um, you know, wh where you supply the key material in the entrusted module is like, I don't know, semi-trusted JavaScript. Richard and I went back and forth on this a fair bit about trying to like figure out how to how to characterize the security properties of a system which had key which had keying in JavaScript and then crypto and on the wire. Um, right, right. Um, um, and it's actually quite complicated, and it really depends on whether you have like, you know, SRI and whether you have like an I'm like, are you doing MLS or are you doing basically SDES? <laughs> um, right. You know. Right. Um, right. So it's really quite hard to hard hard hard. Um, you know, I guess like like I guess I want to be clear. Like like this seems like a, a kind of a, a thing which has like general value. What I'm trying to do is avoid us getting into a bad equilibrium point where like everyone's like, hey, we have like end to end. But actually, when you look at it, when you look at when you pull out the coverage, you're like, hey, FG, I'm really sad about that. Um, so that's the goal I'm trying to avoid. Right. Um, uh, but I think like this obviously has other use cases. I think the other advantage, by the way, of um, you know Richard sort of um, alluded to trying to scope out some other modules would be. We would help us determine which of these limitations that were, that, that, that Harold indicated are, are actual bad limitations, and which ones are like, you know, which ones which ones are livable, right? right? Um, as opposed to like just baking it in and being like two two years down the road, people try to build shit with it, and we're like, ah, fuck. <laughs> so, from a, a process perspective, to your point, Eric, I think probably the right way to approach this is uh, in the explainer clarify that uh, Antoine and Crimson is not a direct use case, it's an opportunity for experimentation. I don't think yeah. the spec itself mentioned to an encryption at this yeah, point. I, I would um, also... And I think we should also document the semi-trusted JavaScript use case um, right. as a new use case in the NV use case document. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd, like, I'd also like to figure out at some point, I think that's okay, I have to read the text, obviously. Um, we also need to figure out at some point, I think, whether we're gonna like what the what the right venue for trying to think about the real um, you know a full end end solution would be. Um, I know there's been a fair amount of interest about MLS in the browser from uh, from both Google from from like a number of uh, both from both from consumers of this uh, of, of MLS and similar technologies as well as from browser vendors. And I've talked to I've talked to um, Emad about this and, and I know we're interested. Um, so I don't know where the heck that would go, um, but we should try. To, but like that's a conversation we have, have as that gets more mature. Is like how do you think about that? Yeah, we. We'll, I suspect that we're going to have to create more uh, formal spaces, whether it's working groups or work work design teams or CGs or whatever, to get this done, get the right people in and get this done right. I, I agree. Um, yeah. I mean, yes, I agree. Uh, and by the way, that's this is a concern for insertable streams. Some of the same issues have been. Yeah, web web codec and web transport are, are kind of in the same boat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. and like, and frankly, I mean, I I didn't catch what you said, Bernard, but I mean, they have the same problem with MLS, right? It's like so great to so have like MLS in the browser, but the next thing that happens is like the it's like the stuff gets rendered in the DOM, <laughs> and now it's like, right, and now right. it's like, exactly. it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like that's like actually a much harder problem for MLS than it is for uh, um um. And we just been some hand waving about it, but I think it's like like I don't know if Richard's hand waving than it, my hand waving, but it's not been very good in my, in my opinion. Right, right. Um, okay. Thanks. Uh, well, I guess I'm certainly happy. I I I I, I can write up some my I I I I know that like you know the comments, see if you answer tomorrow, but like I'll write my, some comments today in line with what I said here, and I think in line with what we just talked about. Um, I'm also happy, happy to submit a, submit a PR to the explainer um, that has has a, has a thing. We go. okay. Thank you. That. Okay, that sounds like we have progress.
We have excellent. Great. Okay. Hmm. Should we go on? Uh, yeah. Is there no more done this? No. no we'll uh, port scanning. Jump, jump to slide twelve. TCP uh, port scanning. Are we are we officially adopting this, or is this just a well decide feedback? So far, all the feedback's positive, so probably yes. Okay, but I should not note that as a decision right now. Yeah. So the not feedback right is now. positive, and the CFC hasn't come, hasn't timed out yet. So it completes uh, tomorrow. Yeah, and uh, Ecker has promised to write a pull request to the explainer saying uh, why it's good for experiment experimentation, but should go, but we shouldn't use it for the, for the for encryption when the real thing is available. So. Back in January, there was an article or two about using WebRTC for TCP port scanning. And usually letting uh, any website on the web scan your TCP ports is not considered good for security. So at some level, the browser need to, needs to say, you asked for this TCP port, I'm not giving it to you. And uh, so I tried to write up uh, some words to add to the document saying, yep, yeah, the browser can refuse to do what you wanted. And then I found that, well, we need to define what does the browser do when it refuses to do what you wanted. So I could do two things that were obvious, one of which was easier to test than the other. We could, uh, the easily testable one is, if you ask for something that the browser doesn't allow, the browser throws an error in your face, deletes every, every piece of information that, that relates to your request, like stats and SDP entries and so on and uh, says, just says no very loudly. The other one is to try to emulate the behavior of, uh, well, uh, this might have been legal or might not have been legal, and I'm trying to hide from you which of it it was, which of them it was. And that's much harder to test. I think I have a proposal that we could extend the web platform test server to allow us to test this, but this it's kind of ugly. So I thought I'd ask the working group for advice on this one. Which approach should we take when it comes to saying, no, if you try, if you try to scan all the ports in the world, it's not going to happen. What's on the list of, of, of forbidden ports that were that like that were that are banding around? There is a list in the fetch spec that contains like uh, four different IRC ports, the X port, and uh, most of the services listed in ETC services. Yeah, the problem, Eric, is that it doesn't cover a lot of really nasty uh, SIP ports that you could use to actually steal money. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, so here, I guess here, here's uh, trying to decide between these two. What I'm, what I'm trying to think about is, uh, what is the, uh, um, what's the probability the legitimate endpoint would generate one of those ports? And if the probability is even remotely high, then error return is going to cause like a bunch of bad, fail bad, bad, surprising failures. If the probability is really low, then like error return looks awesome. <laughs> um, so I just don't know. I don't think that's that question, but it seems like like what you don't, don't want to have is just like call fails one percent of the time because you know because Meet decides that it like wants to allocate that one of those ports for for, for TCP you know turn <laughs> or, or TCP uh, you know uh, 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 candidates. It turns out that uh, deep deep down in WebRTC, it, there's a line that says, "Hey, you asked for a port number less than one thousand and twenty-four. I'll just ignore you." Yeah. But uh, the the fetch spec is kind of more has has some some more things that we shouldn't connect. Yeah. 
Oh and no, then, I, I, I'm totally willing to have a more expansive port list, I guess. But, but like, what, what I'm worried about is like, is like this. If it, with, as I understand what you're saying, is if I had, you know, fifty, if if I had, you know, say, like, let's take the example of like a call, of a call, of a call site, right, which gives you, which gives you, you know, a TCP kit, a, a, a centralized, you know, ice slight guy so it gives you you know a, a tcp port and a udp port because it doesn't know if you can get udp through the, through the tunnel right um and it's like you know 97 percent of people or whatever the number is will be able to get the udp working and if that if, if that if that like one out of 100 times picks a forbidden tcp port then um then, then, then and that causes call failure you're gonna get call failure one of 100 times whereas you know if it if, if it only fails that 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 address then you're gonna get call failure you know um 100 times 0.03 times which is a lot one hundred times point three times is a lot better right so um i'm just trying to figure out how you like um you know what the impact of like is this gonna be like really hard to debug in the field if we have a um if, if we have a if we have if we have a, a hard fail um and maybe it's not but that's why that like and i don't feel strongly about it. i'm trying to raise the issue and make sure people follow through so if we, if we do with edit returns, I mean, if someone is trying to diagnose a port fail, a connect failure, well, stuff doesn't connect for all sorts of reasons. That's why WebRTC is so totally expansive about what it tries to connect to. And so if if we, if we go for the failure, then uh, okay. This candidate failed. Let's try another one. If you go for the silence, then uh, well, you're, you're generating a bunch of other candidates of various sorts. So one of them will probably connect. Hey, Harold. Uh, I think for um, application diagnostics, right, for third-party developers to understand what's going on, it would be really beneficial to be explicit here, right? Whether something failed because of some policy or something failed because of a real network issue, right? So this this might be very beneficial. Uh, although here's a question: Are we actually planning to standardize the list of ports that will be under this policy, or it will be out of uh, for for yeah. browser vendors? For browser uh, for browsers to actually choose which ports they want to block. So my suggestion is that we always block the ones that are already listed in the fetch spec, and we give the browsers latitude to block other ports. So wouldn't does, does that mean we should also update uh, the um, RTC documents um, in IETF to prohibit use of those ports in candidates? Well, they're already in the RFC editor queue, so I am convenient. We're like they're still there. We can work on them. I'm just, I'm just saying, like, like you know, it's, it's, it's been until like, until like right this moment, it's impossible to write a totally conformant thing which would talk to a WebRTC based browser without ever reading any W3C spec, right? And, um, and so if that, if that, if that th this would have the property of changing that, and so, um, that would be so that seems undesirable. I mean. Like I'm not saying I don't I don't get in the list and I don't get any card code in the document. I'm just saying we should make a copy over in IDF, IDF land. Yeah. yeah, part of the problem, Eric, is that there's so many ports that um, couldn't be used to do very nasty things. Like uh, as an example, many PBXs use port 8080. So uh, one of my concerns about this is having any fixed list. Um, is is still going to leave some pretty nasty vulnerabilities out there, um, and that that kind of mean. And I know I realize that's a complication because it means you need to have some kind of policy or something. You know, different enterprises may want to push have different forbidden ports listed. Yeah, yeah no, kind of crappy. Ugly. It's crappy. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we. And I'd also like to say that if someone requ requests three hundred and five. TCP candidates is probably not a good guy. So let's well, yeah. let they know when he's uh, requesting number 306. If we're talking about blocking explicit ports or just blocking because you've tried a million different uh, candidates, then it makes sense to just fail because you can't use the failure as a port scanning. And there's no harm in rejecting the operation, I think. But if we're talking about more in general, like trying to port scan with ICE 
uh, ports that are open on another endpoint that don't speak ice, um, then it might make sense to just fake a timeout so that you can't tell that there is another endpoint with the port open there or something. I'm not sure. Yeah, you've got basically three cases. You're, you're blocking it. You're, you're connecting to it and, it and there's ice there. And you're connecting to it and there's no ice there, no four cases. And connected to it, there's ice there, no ice, and no port. I'd like to mention that uh, error return, uh, if it's under the control of uh, a user agent or maybe let's say uh, an IT guy that can set the list, then it might become a fingerprinting issue. So silently done connect is somehow better there. Hmm. Yeah, that's the first, first uh, argument I've heard where silence is actually more useful. So have we gotten you as much feedback I, as you need, Harold? I'm, to put it this way, I was kind of in the balance, and now I kind of, yeah, don't be silent. So I'm going to rewrite this uh, in uh, terms of uh, uh, act as if it was a valid candidate, just don't connect. <laughs> Yeah, act as if it was a valid candidate that didn't connect. Yeah, that's, that kind of works. OK, okay you went. Have guidance. Next. OK, next slide, uh, media capture automation. Um, so we all know that testing is hard, and testing gets you the media and uh, related uh, children like enumerate devices, device change, apply constraints, blah, 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 are really hard. Um, but it's really beneficial um, for browser vendors, but also for website offers uh, that can ensure that their uh, website is running fine. So what, what should be testable, basically? Um, calling get user media, being able to resolve or reject the different code paths. Um, Maybe when get user media is resolved, there might be changes to the autoplay policies. So being able to test that is good. Constraints matching is also very important. And we know that uh, probably we might have some interop issues uh, in the way we are um, matching constraints. Device change event. I'm not sure that we have any test there. And uh, lately, we added uh, quite a bit of rules related to enumerative enum devices and how it's doing filtering and so on. And these are things that are pretty hard to, to test. So next slide. So the proposal is basically to add a dedicated uh, web driver API. Um, so I drafted uh, like six months or maybe a little bit more now uh, ago, a spec that is basically uh, defining such a web driver API. So you can control whether get user media will uh, reject or not. You can add and remove fake devices and you have some limited control of fake devices capabilities. What this API does not have is things like specifying the content generated by fake devices. Um, so for that, that's the basic idea there is to keep uh, the proposal very simple. Mm -hmm. And also access to real devices uh, is currently out of scope of uh, this API. So I started to talk a little bit about that with uh, some people and they, they were interested. So I'd like at the end of the day that we start working on that in a more uh, standard way. So mm -hmm. hopefully this could be uh, at some point uh, be added as a working group deliverable item. But before that, I was um, wondering whether anybody has thoughts on um, how useful that would be, uh, whether there will be interest in implementing that, and, and so on. So, thoughts? Um, 
just speaking for myself, UN, I think it would be useful. Uh, a lot of the actually WPT test failures we have today are as a result of not having this API, I think. There's a lot of uh, spurious uh, test failures that we get. Um, and in particular, if we're going to, you know, because of all the changes we've made in enumerate devices and stuff, I think it is important to be able to test this. Um, yeah, I, I agree. This is Yana. I agree it would, would be useful. I wish we had this a, a long time ago. Yeah, I think of course. The closer we are to, uh, you know, having completed the spec, I think the usefulness of the of having a web driver API uh, slowly drifts away from you know testing browsers to testing uh, applications mm -hmm. like from because WPTs, um, like with with uh, well speaking for WebRTC. Uh, we kind of got around it by just automatically accepting prompts, uh, okay. which is not perfect and doesn't cover all the cases. But in terms of proving that most of the APIs work, we it was good enough to not have a web driver API. Uh, for get user media, I think it's more important to have a web driver API. Uh, but I also think that we are closer to uh, being complete. So. Uh, I think it's useful. I, I wonder how many tests are left to be written uh, before get user media spec is you know done, so to speak. And in particular, I think uh, with the latest changes to cover privacy, I think uh, it'd be good to have extra tests that show right. that the privacy mitigations that we've added lately actually work. Sure. Hmm. Also, there are. Yeah. Also for the user media, I mean, there are a lot of tests that cannot be done because we don't have something like this. So, yes, so I, I, I wrote I wrote an API, uh, uh, an internal API, some some years back, uh, all time flies, that uh, tried to do something like this, but uh, didn't get that far. So. And because, because I needed it, because I saw all the tests, especially for constraints, that needed to be, be written, but I couldn't so I write them because I didn't have this API. So yes, mm -hmm. it's needed. OK, uh, so, so I guess maybe I can, the, the next step will be to ask for uh, inclusion of uh, this item as a working group item. Mm -hmm. yep. okay. Can you post something to the uh, list also, just about the proposal? Sure, we'll do. Uh, I would be particularly particularly interested in uh, feedback from um, website developers also. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right, so we're going to talk about a couple of privacy issues. I guess Yanivar and Yuen. Yanivar. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm actually going to yield my time on this one to UN, and we can okay. uh, come back to it if need be. OK, so move on to the next one. OK, Thank UN. You. OK, um, so Media Capture Output, I guess, is the name of uh, the spec. So we have an API that allows uh, to set um, the, the speaker for a given media element. So it's called HTML Media Element Setting ID, and it's, it's working fine. But it has some limitations. Uh, the first limitation is that you need to get device IDs, right, to um, to select which device you you are um, sending audio. Uh, currently, Chrome gives IDs, so speaker IDs, if camera or microphone access is granted, basically, which is working fine for typical web conferences. But uh, selecting speakers is something that um, is a bit wider than uh, web conferences. And for instance, uh, webcast scenarios uh, is, is, is a case where you start uh, just listening and you don't want to give a uh, camera or microphone access. Mm -hmm. And at some point, maybe you will want to, to talk, but uh, you, you, you might still want to select uh, your headset, for instance. 
So we have this limitation there. Next slide. So the proposal there is uh, instead of PBD backing on microphone, microphone and camera access, we should basically prompt the user for, for selection. Um, on the right, you can see uh, a prompt there, which is actually a screenshot of what the phone app on iOS is allowing you to choose. And it would be great if the browser could somehow implement that, allow the user to select which device and then return the result as an ID. So I, I see two different options there. Um, one is a, a new API. So basically you add like an API, which is select audio output. So the web page wants the user to select uh, a speaker. It returns a dump string and then you can use setting ID on however HTML media element you actually want to, um, to set the speaker. Of course, if the device is selected there, then it can be exposed in any way devices list. Um, second option, which is in the next slide, is basically, oh, we have HTML media element sensing ID. Uh, if the ID that is given to setting ID is not in the list provided by enumerated devices, setting ID will currently reject. And we can change the spec so that if the ID is null, undefined, or not in the list, then uh, the browser should prompt. And we would be back to, now we have an ID which will be used for the given media element and uh, it will be up to the web page then to set the sync ID, the IDs to how many media elements it actually wants. Um, so there, there are trade-offs between both approaches. Uh, the second option, there's no need for a new API. Uh, the first option is nicer in some sense if you think that maybe in the future you actually want to uh, have web audio as well. So in, the, in that case, um, you might need, it, it might make sense to use se selected your output. In both cases, uh, it should be very straightforward to know whether there will be a prompt or not. And the, the, the site will know whether there's your prompt. If you call select audio output, there will be a prompt. If you call setting ID and the ID is not in the list, you will be prompted as well. So that's the first part of uh, the proposal. I don't know if anybody has uh, thoughts on uh, either proposal or just the idea. No way. Well, um, so I, I like this. No. Uh, uh, there's a certain uh, uh, benefit, I think, to having. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm home here. So um, the set sync ID, having that be asynchronous already is good. And the um, right now there's no penalty for calling it, so having it be, and if we changed it so that there would the JavaScript basically risks showing a prompt, that might actually be a deterrent that's similar to using get user media today to uh, uh, prevent uh, people from sniffing IDs. If that makes sense. Yeah, we definitely need to not allow IDs to be. Um, if you if you allow once an ID, uh, the next time you visit the page, you don't want the, the page to be able to silently know whether the device is there or not. So we need to have a protection in either proposal. And, and I think, uh, I don't know if you're gonna get to persistence of IDs, but I think in the current proposal, it says in the spec that the ID, IDs that are not listed in enumerate devices will not work with setsync ID. I have some concerns with that because um, for instance, some browsers persist permission very easily and others, uh, so for other browsers, so, so websites might get into, into a pattern assuming that uh, they have IDs on, on a revisit even before they've, um, you know, if, if you store an ID in local storage and you revisit the page, if it works in some browsers because of permissions are more permissible there, but not in others, that would be a web compact problem. So I think I it would think be more, more reasonable. So if you have a local storage ID, even if it's not listed in the numerate devices, uh, 
if we could still allow it to work with setsync ID, uh, this might work. You know, if if JavaScript knew that it could call it without a risk of a prompt, it would still leak the information. But if it had risk of a prompt, it would be a deterrent, I feel. And that would be good. Uh, as, I, as I understand it, um, currently, if you load a page, the enumerated devices list will be uh, empty or contain one camera, one microphone, and that's all. So no no speakers. So you, you will will stay with that, that approach, which means uh, that there, there will be no issue. Uh, there, there will be a prompt, basically, if you try to reuse an existing ID. In all cases, no matter the, uh, the permission model of any browser. You, so yeah, then for, you know, option you... one, for option one, how would device change work if uh, application wants to change rendering from speaker one to speaker two? Um, so basically, it means that uh, the user wants to select another device. So you call select audio output, then you will see the prompt with all the devices. Probably you will see. Uh, the device being used, and you can select another one. Are we anticipating scenarios where application would like to render different audios through different output devices? Because today it's definitely uh, possible. So that's issue 87. I believe that 90% uh, of pages cur currently, they just want to use one device for all elements. And in some cases, like maybe 10% or a few percent, uh, they might want to have a main speaker and then some very local elements to override this value. And in which case, um, you will need to be very clear about, I'm clicking and I'm showing a prompt for that purpose. And it's up to the web page to provide the, the context of the purpose. So um, me again on the persistence. Uh, so it's true today that you don't get any devices in the numerate devices uh, for a camera and microphone, but you can still use a stored uh, device ID that's, that's not showing up on the list. You can still use that as a constraint and get user media and have that work, correct? So, yep. so it should be similarly possible here, I think, with setsync ID. If that's possible, then I like it. But, but then uh, you have an issue with uh, pages being able to silently know whether a device is there or not. And, or, or you would say that it's, uh, or the other, the other issue there is that uh, the page might not know whether there will be a prompt or not. And for some websites, it, mm -hmm. they, they dislike it. They really would like, you... is there a prompt or is there, is there no prompt? Wouldn't they know so, well, if that would be the there minute. would be a a prompt or not based on whether or not the device ID is in enumerate devices? So with your Nivar approach, the, ID, uh, the, the point would be that if the ID is actually there, but not listed, it might still work. So, and uh, your Nivar is saying that, oh yeah, but if it's not there, there will be a prompt. So websites will not try to do that, which might be true. Uh, that's up to discussion. Is this an existing um, problem, or or are you foreseeing a possible okay. divergence it's in not, the future? It's not an existing issue because currently uh, the IDs are only um, exposed after get user media prompt, basically after get user media is started. So in that case, would this uh, affect the option A versus option B? In case, I mean, if we agree on what what the behavior should be, because, well, I, I don't know all the different use cases of device IDs, but uh, the the benefit of option A is that you had one have one API to expose it explicitly, and then it's exposed, and then you could use it for different uh, purposes. Whereas mm -hmm. if you 
performed on a specific API, set sync ID, if we invent some other element, then you would need uh, to do a, a, a different prompt. Uh, yeah. That might be good or bad, uh, depending on context. Yep. I like this, the select audio output uh, version better because it uh, was basically an alternative to the user media to allow given authorization to use the output devices. And so, yeah, so I think it's more compatible with, with uh, what we have. And, uh, and that's fine. I, I don't see the problem with, with forbidding uh, set sync ID from working if the device is not listed by enumerated devices because the idea is that if you use set sync ID, the device must be authorized. So, so you need a way to authorize it, and once it's authorized, it, it should be visible in in enumerated. So, so okay. Um, we, we can talk about that as a second oh. issue, I guess. OK, uh, uh, so uh, UN, just for clarification, are you expecting uh, applications to call this method uh, every time, every visit? Um, that's up for discussion. For, um, I had a, a slide, but I, I thought we would not have time to, uh, to discuss about it. Uh, persistency okay. is indeed uh, one thing that we should discuss. But uh, I, don't, I think it's in parallel to that. So. OK. So I mean, I like the naming better for select audio output, obviously. But uh, and I guess we could also have both. Uh, but I guess my concern was more what happens with set sync ID. But we could take that offline, I think. Yeah. Uh, I think that set sync ID is uh, a name that is difficult to relate. So ideally, we, we would rename it to set audio output, for instance, or something uh, similar. But I, I don't know how. How much people will be happy with that? So, I I also think it would be weird if set sync ID becomes the you know the de facto way of asking for an audio output device. Like if there's no way to ask for the device explicitly, you'll set sync ID, you'll get the ID, and then you'll use it for something else like uh, web audio. It, it might be a bit weird. Yeah. Yep. So, 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 audio output seems like. A clean, okay. a clean breakup of the thing into pieces. So some, some extra okay. thoughts from my side as well. Um, so uh, so th th there should be a way for application to have control over which device it chooses. For, for example, right, uh, even if you are seeing some broadcast, right, or sort of hearing to broadcast, you want to play it out. Right, and you application sees there are multiple outputs uh, devices attached to computer, like I don't know headset, speakerphone, and so on and so forth. Application ca can have some smartness to decide on behalf of user which one of them to use, right? And the only thing that application misses is actually user's permission to go and enumerate those output devices, right? So we really just need a way to get a permission and then to enumerate, not like using the system dialogue that you've uh, uh, have a screenshot here, Yohan, but but just internally through enumerate devices, right? W wouldn't that be a scenario? Are you so suggesting ask for permission, enumerate and then select the device yourself through so sync ID or some other means? Now you're running into the whole whole the device selection problem again. Yeah, the, the, the thing is, if, if, you, if, you, if, if you look at what the privacy working group or community group is actually uh, trying to draft. They're drafting various approaches uh, to protect, again, uh, privacy and uh, fingerprinting issues. And um, there are various approaches. Uh, there are like approaches, hey, a CSS property that says, um, paint that in blue if there's a camera. That's, that's something that is uh, very protective. Uh, there are other approaches like a device speaker, and there, there are another approach, which is uh, a permission, and then you have the whole list, and it's up to the website to uh, to do this thing. And in terms of privacy, uh, they rated those different approaches, and they are saying, you should consider first this, and if it's not applicable, then, then this one, and so on. And uh, the device speaker is 
safer in terms of privacy than uh, enumerating the whole list past um, past a prompt. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I agree here. However, in this case, select audio output lacks some hints, right? So that application can tell what it actually wants and what it wants the user agent to prefer, right? Why, why would the application be the decider of what to use? Isn't that a user choice? I mean, inherently? Uh, not, 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 well, it is, it is, but not necessarily, right? Application on behalf of the user can make a smarter choice or at least present the list that it believes would make more sense for the user, right? User, of course, should have a chance to, like, for example, right, front-facing, back-facing camera. So when you do a real-time call, right, you're highly likely to use the front-facing camera, right? So you should put that first in the list, potentially, right? Not the second, you see. I mean, if you, if, or if for example, define... yeah, mm -hmm. or for if example, defining... if you have a real time call and you have headset attached and you have an internal speaker attached, right? Then again, it makes more sense to have a preference to a headset, right? Because user is highly likely to choose that. So I have a proposal for the headset, which is uh, if you are using a microphone uh, and, the, and, the, and the microphone is part of a device like a headset then we should probably expose the headset at the, at the same time we, we are exposing the microphone. Mm -hmm. And then the website will know, oh, there's this microphone which is tied to this uh, audio output, so I will use both without the select audio output approach. Actually, I yeah, I, I like I that. need to give it a more thought. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, um, yep. Go ahead. So, so what's the next step, uh, Yuan? So the select audio output version, there's already a, a PR for that. So I, I guess uh, I will, Yanivar commented on it. So I should try to uh, finalize it and then um, get it merged, I guess, in the spec. Okay. Um, next issue, 87. Um, so uh, set sync ID is great, uh, but basically for most applications, uh, it requires calling set sync ID on all media elements. And plus there's no web audio APIs yet. Plus there's no third party iframe control. And if you look at uh, the typical case, the typical case is that an application will only use one single audio output. Um, the only case I heard in a typical video conference where you might want to use two audio outputs is the case of uh, there's a main speaker and then there are like notifications where you might want the notification to go in a separate, in a separate device. Um, but in most cases, most of the content will go uh, to just one um, output. And it might, and it's already surfacing somehow in uh, operating system, right? In operating system, you, you know which one is the, the main one that is being used. Of course, an application can decide to override that and use something else. But usually, all applications are using the, the same, the same uh, audio output. So I think it would be good that next slide, we actually uh, allow a web page to do the same thing. So the proposal there is to add an API to set the audio output for the whole page. So something like media devices setting ID. And we would keep HTML media element setting ID to override the page default. Uh, my understanding is that it's simpler for most web pages. It's less error prone. Um, it's it also allows uh, web browsers to optimize things, to be able to present to users at OS level what the audio output of this page is, uh, which is nice. And for some uh, operating system, it's also much easier to implement uh, as a first step. Uh, like all the audio will go in only one output for the whole page. Any feedback? 
Uh, question: You say override the default, uh, but can, if if getting a hold of uh, enumerate devices uh, or the device IDs is something that happens uh, with separate um, API calls, I'm I'm wondering what happens if you already set the sync ID on something. Would the that would the default override it on all elements, or would the default only have an effect on you know future created elements? Or so, elements where you haven't called set sync ID yet explicitly. So, media devices set sync ID would apply to all media elements which have not set a sync ID explicitly. Okay. So, uh, at least you can get rid of the silly name here. <laughs> and so, if, yeah. if it's on media devices, it should be the so it probably be a set set default audio output device. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Sure. Set sync ID is extremely cryptic in that position. Sure. It it mirrors oh, HTML oh, elements. I, I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Um, I, I like it too, but uh, just to play devil's advocate, is this really easy to poly? Is this just a polyfill that basically sets all the elements? Um, no, it's also because it's also applying to web audio. It's also applying to third-party iframes. Okay, could you clarify the last point? Because uh, you're saying that third-party iframes would also. Are you saying iframes within that page, whether they're third-party yep. or not, would also be affected by this? True. Yep. Okay. So you're not advocating for a, an iframe control of this feature. Mm. Uh, other than you know, not per iframe. It, it it's Correct. it's a separate discussion that I'm not advocating. Okay. okay. So just clarify the iframe one. So if the iframe has set a sync ID, it won't get overridden or. Uh, currently, it cannot set. But if we are to add an iframe sync ID, then it would not be overridden. Oh, not be overridden. Yeah. So yeah, I think there's a se separate discussion here about whether uh, iframes should be given the permissions policy to call set setting ID themselves. But by default, they would hopefully not have that ability if we do that. And then they would be bound to what the default is in the top level domain. That which sounds good. Cool. Yeah, I like that. Uh and yet, so, so you say it also applies to web audio, but how would web audio opt out of that sync ID? So, the, the, so if, if you're setting the page default audio output, it would apply to web audio. So web audio would not, web audio currently does not have any way to set the sync ID. So they would not be able to uh, override this value, but still it would be applicable to them. Okay, so it doesn't improve the lack of sync ID for web audio, but at least it gives a consistent story. Okay. So I, I like it other than the name, obviously. We should do set audio output to us. So yeah. sh sh should we also think of that for HTML media elements at the ID and rename it? I mean, if, if the semantics are going to be different, then that might be a good idea. If you're going to change it, that should, uh, we should change the name at the same time. But uh, uh, but uh, I would argue that setsync ID is much less ambiguous there because it's a media element. Of course it has, of, co of course it does media. By the way, is there a set sync ID none? Um, so, yeah. So I have other ideas where we would define things like um, well-known static device IDs. Some <laughs> of them being none, default, earpiece, and uh, built-in speaker, something like that. But uh, it's uh, another discussion that we can leave uh, for today. Good
Maybe on the pull request when it comes. Yep. Okay, I'll try to to write it as well. Okay. Uh, do you want to go back to your uh, item, Yanifar? Uh, well, this is mostly an informative slide anyway that uh, relies on the uh, user chooses proposal. Uh, so, um, and it's merely an observation that if we go for forward with that proposal, then um, the slide argues that it uh, removes the need for uh, media device info get capabilities, basically. And as far as my understanding of it was that the original reason for why you can enumerate devices and get the capabilities of each device after permission is that it uh, was needed so that sites, most WebRTC sites that I've tested actually have some constraints, like in min and max. So uh, for them to build their own device pickers, uh, if you go into the option settings on the site, uh, they would, in order to enforce the same constraints, like uh, nothing below 64480, for example, uh, to build a picker, they, they need all this information so that they can filter out the list that they show. But it's a trouble of uh, fingerprinting information, so that would be good to get rid of. So I guess that there's just uh, the only question here is any, if anyone see, anyone in the group know, can think of any other use cases for this uh, feature. Otherwise, um, I'd like to work on axing it. So uh, just to say that Safari does not support Media device info get capabilities. Um, that said, I see some value in it. So I'm, I'm not against it because we haven't implemented it yet. Um, I, I'm not against removing it. I think that in terms of fingerprinting, somehow it's fine because you expose the device. So, um, and I, in general, I prefer, since we have a media device info, I prefer that it's we have the get capabilities at the media device info level than at the media stream track level. Um, but we have at, at both currently, so. OK, uh, Firefox does not implement it yet either. But uh, just to clarify, I believe that once you've given permission to one camera, for instance, then you call enumerate devices, you still get a list of all devices, correct? So you would get a lot of information on all your devices. Well, I guess that right. once we have user chooses, we, we should try to change that. <laughs> yes, uh, well, yeah. so that's basically the goal. paving the way for this, yeah. yeah. Well, once we have, uh, have uh, experience that, uh, that users will switch to user chooses, we should try <clears throat> And also, I should say that the uh, current plan for user chooses, uh, we haven't had time yet to do experiments. So it might have to be split up into a separate document, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. OK. So that's it for me. OK. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, we finally got to the end and actually covered everything in a meeting, which has been the first time that's happened in a while. That's a good thing. OK. And I guess somebody inserted a slide where we're naming the bird after Sergio. <laughs> okay, take care, everybody. I right, see you. Thank you. Bye. Bye for now. Bye.